Thank you, David. And hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me uh, well and clear, and uh, I hope that all of you are well and safe wherever you are. Uh, it's a pity I couldn't join you physically in Yorkshire to tonight, but uh, maybe we'll have another opportunity in the future. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about this project and why we at the Meridian Society embarked upon it. First of all, the Meridian Society is a um, not-for-profit uh, charitable organization, and we exist to promote Chinese culture through talks and uh, trips to China, et cetera, et cetera, a whole range of activities. And um, when the centenary of the beginning of uh, World War I was approaching, we thought, well, you know, we should try to do something. And so we started looking around to see what we could actually do as a project. And all of a sudden, you know, on the internet popped up the Chinese Labour Corps. Now, I will be honest with you, prior to my surfing the internet, I myself did not know anything about this Labour Corps at all. So it was a total enlightenment for me and for my colleagues at the Meridian Society. Anyway, after discovering their story, we thought this is definitely worth doing. And so we applied to the Heritage Lottery Fund for a grant. And with that grant, we were able to conduct a three year um, uh, project uh, commemorating the Chinese Labour Corps through making an oral history film uh, with descendants of laborers in China, as well as uh, of dis uh, with descendants of their commanding officers in Britain and Canada and so on. Um, and had I been able to come up to Yorkshire, I would have loved to show this uh, film to you, but as things are, um, you'll have to be satisfied with this, present, uh, this PowerPoint presentation this evening. Um, but if any of you are interested, do please go to our website, the Meridian Society, and on there, if you look under special projects and under the Chinese Labour Corps, you will actually see our film. So you can, in fact, catch it. So today I'm going to give you the background to the story of the Chinese Labour Corps, without which it would be quite difficult to understand how China became involved in World War I and what the obstacles were uh, throughout and why it turned out to be such a huge tragedy for China after all its efforts. Uh, so this evening is essentially going to be a history lesson and I hope that doesn't turn you off but uh, let's see, I, I hope that this will be an interesting history lesson which um, some of you may not know too much about. Okay so as you can see here on the, uh, the first page, we have the name of our project, the Chinese Labour Corps, Forgotten Faces of the Great War. And I shall explain to you why we use this name, Forgotten Faces of the Great War. Now, as I say, we have to go back in history to understand why China got involved. And invariably, when you talk about modern China, people throughout the country, particularly young ones who go to school, the very first thing that they will learn, or practically one of the first things that they will learn about their own history, is what we call China's century of humiliation. And this century of humiliation is basically begins from 1840, the first Opium War, when, as I'm sure many of you know, Britain uh, was trying to sell opium to China so that they could get enough revenue to pay for the tea and the uh, tea and silk and porcelain that was coming out of China as luxury goods to um, embellish the homes of the rich over here. Now. Uh, of course, a lot of people, I mean, I'm talking about millions and millions of people did get addicted to opium. And it was not until 1840 that a very brave commissioner, a Chinese, brave Chinese commissioner down in Guangdong province in the south, decided that he was going to do something about this. And so he burned a whole consignment of opium 
on the shores of the Pearl River. And at that point, Britain then declared war, and this was the first opium war, which China lost. Um, uh, it was a dreadful failure for China, in fact, because up till then, China never really engaged in a full-scale war, certainly not with a foreign country. And so they didn't really have a navy to speak of. They didn't have an army to speak of. So that was a disaster from the very beginning. That was followed by the Second Opium War of 1856 to 1860, when Britain tried to legalize opium in China. Once again, the Chinese government tried to rebel against this, but to no avail. Then you have 1884, the Sino-French War. After that, 1894 to 1895, the first Sino-Japanese War. I won't go into detail about these wars. Suffice it to say that there were quite a few of them, and these are the main ones. I mean, there were many of them. And then the final major um, battle that was waged in China and mainly in Beijing was the Boxer Uprising from 1899 to 1901. Um, I will come back to the Sino-Japanese War uh, at the very end, but just uh, be aware that there were all of these major wars. At the end of each of these wars, all of which China lost miserably, there was always the signing of a treaty. And the Chinese have always called these unequal treaties. Unequal because invariably the foreign powers, and this included not only Britain, but also France, Belgium, um, uh, America as well, the Japanese, the Russians, Austro-Hungary, uh, hung Hungary. All of these countries would demand various things from China, including extraterritorial rights, for example, within China. So typically what that means is, is that they would um, take over one particular part of the country, uh, install themselves over there, and they would typically have concessions where only the uh, expatriates of that particular nation would live, and they were beyond Chinese law. So that was extraterritorial um, uh, rights. They also stationed troops there. They exacted indemnities, huge indemnities from China. And China was literally on the brink of collapse politically and economically and socially. So these are the unequal treaties. And I mentioned just before that a lot of these um, uh, Western imperialist countries would go into China and take up one particular part, one particular region of China, which was of um, special benefit to them. And as a result, the Chinese called this taking up of, you know, um, taking over parts of China as being carved up like a melon. And there you can see on the left-hand side, Queen Victoria, you can see the, the uh, German Kaiser, the Tsar of Russia, J the Japanese emperor, and of course you have France behind. And right at the very back, you have the Qing emperor, totally helpless. So that is China being carved up like a melon. As you can imagine, the people of China were not terribly happy with this state of affairs. So by 1911, after the successive failures um, at each battle, the people then started rebelling. And the result of this was the Xinhai Revolution. Um, they felt that the imperial dynasties that had been ruling China thus far were of no use whatsoever to the country. They had only their own interests at heart. And as a result of their own complacency really, um, they were unable to rule China. So the Xinhai Revolution marked the collapse of the Qing dynasty, which was in fact the very last dynasty of China. When that collapsed in January 1912, we had the establishment of the Republic of China. That was followed by 1916 to 1928 by the warlord era. Now, just going back to the establishment of the Republic of China, 
at the beginning, everyone was extremely exhilarated by the fact that a new republic had been established in the country. Um, not only the Chinese themselves, because hopefully it, it was the promise of new things to come, but also by the Western world, because they thought that this was the beginning of a democracy and they would then be able to trade with China, which had always tried to repel um, foreign forces and was not particularly interested in, in foreign trade and certainly didn't want their own resources to be depleted by, by the foreign powers. However, things were not quite that simple because during the imperial dynasties, um, rather like feudal Britain, feudal France, uh, et cetera, um, in the old days, the king or the emperor would have a huge number of dukes under them. And each duke, whenever a duke won a battle for the emperor, then he would be given a fiefdom or a dukedom. Now in China, the equivalent of these dukes were warlords. And you can well imagine they had all got themselves securely in their own parts of China with their own armies incidentally and very strong armies they were too. So when the Republic of China was established, they weren't going to just simply give up all their land, give up all their influence. So during uh, the warlord era from 16 to 28, you had a lot of them just fighting each other, trying to gain larger territories for, for themselves and to basically um, establish small dominions for themselves. So China was still in utter chaos at this point. Now, here we have a map of China around the 1900s, and it shows you the foreign spheres of influence. Now, each of these areas uh, is color coded, and you can see that the red parts, um, sorry, the, the pink parts are the ones where Britain was particularly dominant. Um, the blue parts are where France was dominant, and can you see just above the pink part to the right hand side, to the east side, along the eastern seaboard, if you go up the coast, you can see Shanghai. And just above the pink part, you have a massive green part. But if you continue up that eastern seaboard, you see a sort of a mustardy colored part and you have the city of Qingdao. Qingdao is a huge port city, still extremely famous now, but that mustard colored region was very much under the control of the Germans. And this is very central to the story of the Chinese labor corps. Now, if you look at that map, see where the position of Qingdao and the whole of that province, Shandong, uh, the whole of that mustard colored area is in fact the, the province of Shantung. Can you see how very close it is to Japan? It's alarmingly close. And China at this time, of all the imperial powers that were forcing themselves upon the country, they were most afraid of Japan. So we'll go to the next slide. And here you have a magnified version of that province, Shandong province. And you can see that it's virtually a sort of a, you know, flattened a diamond shape. But can you see that there are two sides of that diamond, which are entirely coastline. So for the Japanese who were literally just across the water, this was a fantastic part of China that they could very easily occupy. And if they did do so, then they would have total access to the various ports along that coastline. So they were eyeing this all the time. But at this point, prior to World War I, this was, as I say, occupied by Shandong province. Uh, sorry, by the Germans, I beg your pardon. So, uh, sorry, if I could just go back. Now, the reason that the Chinese wanted 
to get involved in World War I was because they could see that either they could side with the Western Allies or they could side with the Germans. But they realized that if by any chance the Germans lost in the war, then obviously Shandong province would then be freed up. And China felt at that time that if they then got involved in World War I and sided with the allies to fight off the, the Germans, then as a reward at the end of the war, the Western allies would give them back, give back control of Shandong province to China. The reason that China wanted to regain control of this province particularly is because of the Japanese threat that I mentioned. And so as soon as World War I breaks out on the Western Front, China then approaches the Western allies and makes three offers of help. The first time they offer 50,000 soldiers to Jiaozhou Bay. And if I can just go, uh, and the second time they offered soldiers and laborers to the Western Front. And the third time they offered 300,000 laborers to Europe. Now, let me just go through each of these offers and why they had to make three offers and why each offer uh, wh why the first two offers were rejected. Um, the 50,000 soldiers to Jiaozhou Bay. Jiaozhou Bay is uh, part of that coastline that we saw just before. And um, they, China said, well, we can try to defend this against the Germans uh, so that, you know, they, they, so that the Germans can't then go off back to Germany and, and you know, build up their forces over there. So if we defend that, then you should be okay and, and the rest of you should be able to concentrate your, all your military efforts at the Western Front. But the reason that this was rejected out of hand was because number one, no one, as you all of you well know, imagined that the war would be as protracted as it was. Everyone thought that it was going to end in a few months time. Of course, it did not. But anyway, they thought, well, you know, we don't need you because the war's going to be over. Secondly, China had proved itself totally incapable of defending its own borders, never mind Western Europe. And so that was, you know, just total nonsense as far as the Western allies con were concerned. The third reason is because China at the time was in fact a neutral power. So legally and diplomatically, it could not have been involved in the war. So as I say, that first offer was poo-pooed out of hand. So China didn't give up and instead said, okay, look, we'll, we'll send a combination of soldiers and laborers to the Western Front. But still, China was in fact a neutral country and this was a binding problem. And so they still couldn't send soldiers. Then finally they said, okay, how about just laborers instead? So at this point in 1916, you have the, the French who decided, yes, we are going to need those laborers because of course things were getting very bad at the Western Front. They, the French knew that they needed every single able-bodied person at the front line and they needed laborers to help with logistics behind the lines. And so France was the first Western ally to say, yes, we do need you. And so in 1916, the first batch of French recruits went over to Western Europe. Then in July, 1916, you have the Battle of the Somme. And all of you know much better than I do as members of um, the WFA, that of course the Battle of the Somme the, the, the death toll for Britain was just incredibly high. And as a result of that, Britain then finally realized we can't continue like this. We too need reinforcements. So every single able-bodied man went to the front to fight. And so someone then had to do 
the, the support work at the back. So in January 1917, the first batch of British recruits left China to go to Western Europe. Then in February 1917, um, a transport ship, a French transport ship called the SS Athos, went over carrying over 500 laborers and they were sunk by a U-boat in the Mediterranean and the, the, everyone on board, including all five to 600 uh, Chinese laborers, died in, in that sinking. And at that point, China then had the excuse to declare war against Germany. So now it was absolutely legal for China to be involved in the Great War. Now, we, this is a map of China. Um, and here, uh, the, the spelling of all the names are all uh, modern Chinese, by the way. So there might be a few that you don't um, recognize. But if you can see the two red cities in the top right hand corner of that yellow patch, you'll see Qingdao again with the new spelling and Weihai. Now, these two were very important ports. And it was from these ports that the vast majority of laborers left. Um, now, all of those provinces marked in yellow were the provinces where the laborers had been recruited from. And they go right down to Guangzhou in the south, and of course, Hong Kong, the island of Hong Kong, right in the far south. And to begin with, in fact, Hong Kong by then was in fact a British colony owing to the uh, Opium War. And so to begin with, Britain thought, well, we can easily recruit people from Hong Kong because that is one of our colonies and there won't be any obstacle from China. But what they didn't realize and what they did subsequently come to realize was that of course, Hong Kong is, you know, a very hot climate, um, almost tropical at certain times of the year. But when you look back at any black and white footage, film footage and photographs of the Western Front, I suppose the, the one, the single, you know, image that you, you, you always remember is the mud. And although you can't feel the temperature in those photographs, you can kind of sense that it was always cold and damp. And these were just extremely harsh for, for people from the south of China. You, know, you, always, you also know that uh, laborers had been um, recruited from India and from Egypt. Uh, and you know, once again, because of the colonial uh, link, but once again, it was extremely difficult for them to withstand those harsh winters. And so one person in the British Army suddenly had a wonderful idea and they said, hold on, hold on. Why not go up to Shandong province and recruit from there? And the reason that they did that is because in China, the people of Shandong are called Shandong Da Han. Da Han literally means big fellow. So in Chinese, Shandong big fellows. And although we don't have any sort of, you know, ratio by which to measure this person, and you can see actually from that photograph that this person standing at the front is big. He's big and burly and extremely strong. And also you must remember that Shandong was largely rural. Most of them were poor, uneducated peasant farmers, and they were used to hard work and they were used to harsh weather as well, being uh, from the north part of China. So it was decided that most of the recruits would come from this one big province of Shandong. And when they came over and started work, the war office noticed that they were remarkably able. And they said that these men were inured to hardship and almost indifferent to the weather. So they were absolutely perfect for the job. Now, 
we're going back to the recruitment of the Labour Corps. And on the left hand side, you can see um, a, a British officer, um, a, a clerical person, getting fingerprints from these two recruits. Fingerprints simply because, as I mentioned just before, they were largely um, illiterate peasant farmers. And so they were unable to sign anything. And so the only way that they could show their identity was by putting their thumbprint onto the piece of paper. And on the right hand side, you can see this um, identity card. Each one of them had an identity card like this. And there at the bottom, you can see two big fat thumbprints. Um, now this man actually came, the, the photograph that you see here at the top, uh, just above the thumbprints, is of a man who came from Tianjin. And um, sorry to digress a little bit, but I must tell you the story because it's, it's such a sad story. Um, this man actually never even got to the Western Front. He was taken by ship to Canada, and I'll come to that story in a little, uh, in a little while. And um, he was very ill on the uh, Ocean, uh, while, while crossing the ocean, so that by the time he got to Canada, he was just unable to really go any further. And he was on his deathbed. And at that moment, he said to the doctor, to the Canadian doctor who was looking after him, he said, I know I'm going to die. And I, so I'm going to give this ID card to you. And this is the only piece, this is the only example, this is, sorry, the only photograph I have ever, ever had taken of myself in my entire life. And I want you to take this identity card back to China, find my mother and give it to her. Sadly, that never happened. Um, the doctor took the ID card and it is one of his descendants who then passed it on to me. Um, but we were able about two, three years ago when we were actually undertaking this uh, project for the, with the Heritage Lottery Fund, we were able to go to Tianjin and find the village from which this young man had come from. And one of my colleagues back in China managed to find an elderly lady and said, do you know anything about this family called... Um, well, this person was called, uh, I can't remember his name, but he had a certain surname. And he said, do you know anything about this family? And the elderly lady said, oh, yes, I do know something about this family. Um, the father died when he was very, very young. I remember that the son went overseas somewhere to Europe, can't remember where, but he went overseas and never came back. And the mother just gave up hope knew that you know, she'd lost her husband, lost her son, and so decided to remarry. And when she remarried, she and her new husband went off and I have no idea where they are. So that was the end of the family line, but a really, really sad story there. So now we come back to Shandong province. And the reason that um, the British recruited largely from here were multiple. Uh, one was because, as I mentioned, you had two large ports, Weihai and Qingdao, from where they could transport most of the people. Secondly, because they knew that the Shandong big fellows were full of muscles and were able to do the job and would be perfectly good at adapting themselves to the weather. But a third very important thing was because of the legacy of the Germans. Now the Germans did do China a great favor. They did two wonderful things for China. The first one was to build a brewery from which we get Qingdao beer. And I'm sure that many of you have tasted Qingdao beer before and the brewery still stands there today. And it's, it's you know the biggest exporter of beer from China. The other major contribution that the Germans made to China was to build a railroad. And this railroad ran from Qingdao westwards to uh, Weifang, 
Zibo. Can you see it's sort of just above these these cities are just above the word Shandong to Weifang, Zibo, Jinan. Jinan is the province of uh, sorry is the capital of Shandong province and a little bit further. So because of this wonderful railroad, the British were able to penetrate deep into the province and therefore recruit people from the innermost parts of the uh, of the province. And at this point, I have all I must also add that the missionaries, the British missionaries and Canadian missionaries, American too, who are working in these rural areas of China, they also made a huge contribution to the uh, to the recruitment of people because they were already in the heartland of China and they were able to speak Chinese, they were fluent in Chinese. And so they would put posters up for the British on behalf of the British army, um, calling for uh, people to join um, the, the uh, Chinese labor corps. And it was because of their work largely, as well as the railroad that finally um, uh, quite a lot of men did actually leave from Shandong province. Now, let's look at the shipping routes. You have here the map of, a map of the world with two routes, more or less two routes in two different colors. The blue color is the route that the French took. Now, if you go to China, which is marked in yellow on the right-hand side of the map, you can see that they came largely from Shanghai rather than Qingdao because the French had a stronghold in Shanghai. And from Shanghai, the ship would go southwards to Hong Kong, then to Southeast Asia, across the Indian Ocean, and then up the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean, up to Marseille, and then by train up to Northern France. I mentioned, however, that U-boat activity uh, that, that sank the SS Atos was now getting very intense in the Mediterranean. So the French then opted as a second route, a very southern one that went down via the south, southern part of Africa and up through Gibraltar and to Marseille or around the other way up to La Havre. Now that was the French route, obviously a much shorter route, but because of the sinking of the Atos, the British thought, look, we're going to have to pay for these recruits and we do need them very desperately. So we can't afford to lose any through U-boat bombings. And so in their great wisdom, they decided to take a completely different route. So going from the east part, eastern part of China, you can see the Q there, which stands for Qingdao, and the beginnings of a red line. And from Qingdao, they would go eastwards, right around the Pacific, and end up at Vancouver. From Vancouver, the recruits would then go onto uh, a train up to Halifax, and from Halifax, they would then go off to Devonport in the south of England, or uh, subsequently to um, Liverpool. And from there, they would take trains to Folkestone and move from Folkestone overland, um, sorry, uh, over, the, over the channel to uh, Boulogne. Now, the reason for pointing this out is that, as you can imagine, the, the journey was not only long, taking three months, but a lot of it was over the sea. And for these Chinese peasant farmers, they'd never seen the sea in their lives. And they had never, certainly never been on board a ship. So a lot of them suffered immensely from seasickness. Many of them died during uh, the crossing. They were all put in the hold they were where they slept. And so you can imagine that the conditions were, were very bad. And so when they arrived at Vancouver, 
many of them didn't even make it to Vancouver. They'd actually perished en route. Uh, there, are, there is in fact a cemetery at Vancouver and another one at Halifax where a number of uh, recruits were buried. These were people who had died of sickness and that includes that young man whose ID card you saw just before. There was a southern route as well, which went south um, from, from Vancouver and then across the Panama Canal and up that way to Britain. So these were the two major routes that the French and the British took. And here you can see the Chinese Labour Corps at Boulogne. Now altogether about 96 to 97,000 Chinese labourers were recruited by the British. A further 40,000 were recruited by the French. So we're talking about 140,000 men, not exactly a number that you can overlook by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, the reason that I've, I'm showing you this photograph is because I don't know whether any of you have ever been to Xi'an in China or heard of the terracotta wa warriors, but this reminds me very much of those rows and rows and rows of terracotta warriors in China. So that's Boulogne and the Chinese Labour Corps arriving. This is the contract that the British gave them. Now, it's, um, I don't think that you can see it terribly well, but um, the French paid the laborers in situ in France. What the British chose to do instead was to pay their laborers one franc. Um, oh, hold on, just let me get a few details here. Uh, let's see. Uh, the contracts were, first of all, the men were organized into battalions and companies, and they were super, supervised by gangers or foremen kind of thing. And those gangers in turn came under senior gangers. So there was quite a hierarchy, uh, hierarchy within the recruits. Now, the contracts typically spanned three years. And at the end of the three years, it could be extended if the laborers wanted to stay on or if um, the British Army decided they that they needed the, the laborers to stay on. Now, according to these contracts, they were supposed to work 10 hours a day without respite, 10 hours a day for 365 days of the year. So there was no weekend, but for the Chinese, the pay was worth it because after all, paltry though it was compared with what say, soldiers were getting, it was a lot for the Chinese. Now, in exact terms, they received one franc a day in Europe. And if they were a ganger, it was uh, up to 1.5, one and a half francs. Now, the majority of the money, the wages, were given to the families back in China. And there they were given, the families were given 10 silver dollars per month or 15 silver dollars in the case of gangsters. And we're talking about silver Mexican dollars. And the reason that the British paid the families as opposed to the men was because the men, these, these Chinese laborers at the front had one huge weakness and that was a weakness for gambling. And you must remember that they were unable to write, read or write. They were largely uneducated. Therefore, they weren't able to really occupy themselves in the evenings. Uh, and the only way that they could have a bit of fun was to gamble. And it became a very serious problem with um, a lot of the French recruits and they would find themselves gambling their entire wages away. And so the British thought, well, let's prevent this from happening by paying the families instead, which was a very good idea in principle, except that many of the families were unaware that they had to go and collect this money from the recruitment stations. So the money was never sent to the villages the villagers had to go to the recruitment stations 
uh, all of which were in the larger cities and larger towns. And as you can imagine, you know, when you're talking about villages that are in remote parts of China, they were hardly able to make that trip. And, and, and also they weren't even aware that they had to make the trip. So a lot of these laborers ended up working for literally nothing because their families had just not received the pay. So that is uh, the contract. Um, and it was only after some rebellious act, action on the part of the, the Chinese that the British then finally said, okay, you don't have to work 365 days a week. We'll give you one day off the Chinese New Year. And so they managed to get their one day off uh, for Chinese New Year. Now, the kind of work that they did, uh, here are a few photographs of them um, loading and unloading cargo on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, building railroads. And of course, that was essential to get munitions to the front. They also um, dug a lot of trenches. And here on the left-hand side, you can see them um, carrying railway sleepers. I remember uh, giving another talk to another branch of um, the WFA in London. And uh, let's see, yeah, here, here's, a, here's a statistic that you might be interested in. Um, on the departure, I'm, I'm reading from a particular Captain Hickmott's diary. He said, on the departure of, the, of this company of uh, Chinese Labor Corps commanded by uh, Captain Hickmott, um, he wanted to express his appreciation of the good work that the company had done. And they had performed a task on both railways and sleepers, which is better than I have seen or heard of in many a district. And it set a standard of work which has been very valuable. And apparently they would offload on average 12 tons per coolie per day. That was for offloading. For loading, they would on average be able to load eight tons per coolie per day. And um, the, the reason I mention uh, this, this other talk that I gave at another WFA branch, when I read that out, um, uh, and the next statistic, which was for loading and offloading sleepers, the task was 140 sleepers per coolie for, for 80 pound sleepers and 180 sleepers per coolie for 100 weight sleepers. And, um, and one of the attendees who's a fireman said, my God, not even we firemen can manage that kind of load. So clearly the, the Chinese were very hardworking and very muscly as well. Uh, but apart from the ones who did manual labor, there were quite a lot of skilled laborers as well. There were carpenters, you know, joiners, and also people who were able to work with machines. So you can see on the right hand photograph that they're actually working in a riveting factory, and they also were able to help repair tanks and so on. Um, another task that they did was to collect um, munitions, unexploded munitions or spent bombs and shells from the fields. And you can see them on the left uh, shouldering a couple of bombs there and then on the right hand side um, also uh, dealing with unspent munitions. So a highly dangerous job. And the reason that I mentioned that is that the contract had stipulated all along that the Chinese would not be in any area of danger and absolutely nowhere near the front line. As the battle intensified, however, a lot of them were in fact pushed to just behind the lines. Uh, now, here's an example of a shell that I managed to get from on eBay and this is a huge uh, 70 pound shell. Uh, as you can see from the right hand photograph, it was, um, it 
was made in 1918. It's a German shell. And on the left-hand side, it's carved with Chinese motifs. You have the bamboo and a pine. And at the top, you have four characters reading from right to left, yi dui fu xing. And I'm not sure precisely what that refers to. Yi is the number one. Dui could refer to any sort of platoon or company or battalion. Fu xin literally means lucky star. And I wasn't quite sure what lucky star could be possibly mean. I asked a lot of museum curators and they said, it's definitely not an army division. The army would never use the word star. It could be a ship. But I looked up all the transport ships that the Chinese had been on and none of them were called Lucky Star. Then a number of people from Shandong province who, who I contacted said, well, you know, very often in Chinese, we call a person a lucky star if we think that that person actually brings you the family good fortune. So it could be that the person who engraved this thought that the company or the battalion to, to which he belonged thought that it was a lucky battalion and therefore he's written, carved uh, these, these four characters. But the, um, why I'm showing you this is so that you can see not only were they actually skilled in metalwork, but the level of artistry is actually quite high. So they might have been uneducated, but they had a sense of aesthetics. Um, and also uh, one of the curators at the In Flanders Fields Museum, uh, who has collected quite a few of these pieces of trench art said to me, it's also very interesting to see that um, the vast majority of these pieces of trench art have Chinese motifs on them. And it indicates to me that they obviously felt homesick. And so they would carve, uh, engrave motifs that would remind them of home. That was uh, thought quite a good point. So anyway, they made a tremendous impression on, on uh, Douglas Haig and who, who said, by Jove, I wish I had a whole army of those chaps properly trained. So he was clearly very pleased with them. And here's the Chinese living in, in a typical camp. And these camps were just um, simple tents. Um, but once they got, uh, most of these were temporary camps, but once they settled in a particular place, then they would live in, in barracks of a kind. This one was taken on their one day off, and that is Chinese New Year. And you can see here British officers in the front, of, in the bottom half of the photograph, and up there on the hill, uh, not very clear, but with the flags on the right hand side, as well as on the left, are all the Chinese laborers, and they're getting ready for all their Chinese New Year parades, which is a big thing in, in rural China, even today. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a second. But the point of showing you this particular picture is, as you can see, right across the middle of this photograph, you can see a fence running from left to right. And that fence, unfortunately, uh, does actually show that all the Chinese laborers who had been recruited by the British were not allowed to mix with the British. French recruits lived almost side by side with their French counterparts. But as far as the British were concerned, there was no mingling at all. So the Chinese were kept to themselves. The reason, the control of labor said, it caused a loss of prestige and much decreased efficiency. Well. Don't know about that, but anyway. Uh, uh, now, okay, so first of all, um, it, it talks about decreased efficiency. Now, I said just before that uh, Field Marshal Douglas Haig was very impressed by them, but, you know, let's face it, there were a few ne'er-do-wells even within the Chinese Labour Corps. And I must read you this because I found it so amazing, uh, so, so amusing. Um, Here's a photograph of one 
um, one particular person who was not terribly good, and he was called Chief Rebel Tish Key. And this comes from a from a, a British uh, officer's diary, and he describes Tish Key in the following way. He says, before coming to France, Tish Key was a professional beggar in Tianjin. He was associated with a gang of rogues and frequently punished for rebellious conduct. He had not been in France long when sentenced to imprisonment for inciting coolies to riot. After release, he was posted to 185 Company where he distinguished himself by keeping up a bad record. Somehow he possessed a magnetic influence over his colleagues and could prompt and persuade them to act instinct instinctively in any cause or direction. So that was Chief Rebel Tishki. But here you have a photograph of four jolly good coolies. And um, as I say, most of them did do a very good job. So never, November 1918, armistice is declared. And soon after, the Paris Peace Conference is held. Now, going back to the history to the earlier part of the history lesson, you remember that I said that China wanted to be involved in, in the war and wanted to side with the allies so that the allies would reward them by giving uh, the province of Shandong, taking the province of Shandong out of the hands of the Germans, who were the, of course, the, the losers, and giving it back to China. And China wanted desperately to regain control of Shandong province to prevent the Japanese from coming into China. That was the main aim. However, unbeknownst to a lot of people, secret pacts had been signed between Japan and Britain. I had alluded to the earlier fact that China was offering to send 50,000 soldiers to the coast of Shandong province to ward off the Germans. While Britain would have nothing to do with that, in the end, they allowed the Japanese to come over and do exactly the same job that the Chinese had wanted to do in the first place. And the condition of that, on, as far as the Japanese was concerned, was that if the allies won the war, then they would give the province of Shandong to Japan. What was worse, however, was that in 1915, as a result of unending conflict between Japan and China, uh, at the end of which China invariably lost, the Japanese drew up a treaty called the 21 Demands. This was finally whittled down to 15 demands, but according to the 21 demands, China would have to give up all rights in Shandong province. Furthermore, in 1918, there was a Sino-Japanese military alliance, which was signed once again with Japan insisting that they be given con total control over Shandong province and that they should be allowed to post their own garrisons within the province. And the reason that China had to accede to this is because China, as a result of all of those wars and internal as well as external, was now on the brink of economic disaster. China had approached Western Europe and the Americans for finance to help them bring them out of this of dire poverty. But of course, with the Great War having broken out on the Western Front, clearly Europe was unable to help China. They had to help themselves. And so the only country that China could turn to for economic help at the time was Japan. So China was unable to really help itself. Now we come to the negotiating powers and you have on the left Woodrow Wilson, in the middle David Lloyd George and on the right Georges Clemenceau. The Americans were actually quite sympathetic to the Chinese cause and to begin with they said yes 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 you know we should certainly reward them in some way 
But Lloyd George and Clemenceau said absolutely no. And in fact, Arthur Balfour, who was the foreign minister at the time, said China's participation in the war had involved neither the expenditure of a single shilling nor the loss of a single life. And as it happens, at least 2,000, probably many thousand more um, Chinese laborers died at the Western Front, partly through disease, the Spanish flu as well, partly because they had been caught in the crossfire or had been there when bombing um, happened. And so, you know, Arthur Balfour really has no, no justification for saying that. However, that was what he claimed. So as a result, at the Paris peace talks, um, it was decided that Shandong province would be taken out of the hands of the Germans and given to Japan. You can imagine that there was a huge uproar in China when they heard about this. And in May 1919, specifically on May the 4th, Chinese students take to the streets of Beijing. And there they are by Tiananmen on May the 4th, 1919. And this became a nationwide movement involving mainly intellectuals, but then also subsequently involving laborers and, and many, many more. Um, and this became known as the May the 4th movement, very much led by left-wing people, you know, revolutionary um, uh, radicals. June 1919, the Treaty of Versailles is signed. July 1921, unsurprisingly, you have the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. That was a result, a direct result of the May the 4th movement that we heard about just before. 1927 to 50, you have civil war between the communists on the one hand and the nationalists who were in power. 1931, as a result of Shandong province having been given control uh, to, to the Japanese, Japan invades the Northeast Manchuria. And there they are marching in. You have in from 1937 to 1945, the second Sino-Japanese war. I'm sure many of you have heard of the massacre uh, the Nanjing Massacre, in which conceivably 20 million um, soldiers, Chinese soldiers and civilians were killed um, in, in Nanjing alone, but there was devastation throughout the country. And it was only in 1945, as you know, with the end of World War II and the defeat of Japan because of the bombing, you know, the atom bomb, um, in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that the Japanese then had to surrender and finally left China. One very radical philosopher in China by the name of Kang Youwei said, there is no such thing as an army of righteousness which will come to the assistance of weak nations. And of course, those words were proven true. And then to add insult to injury, back in um, uh, 1916, very shortly um, after, after the war had broken out, um, a couple of French artists decided to paint a huge painting called the Pantheon de la Guerre. And it was so huge, it would actually take up this whole museum or gallery, you know, all the walls of it. And it was a round, round building, circular building. And they started painting this. And of course, they thought that, you know, obviously the Western Allies was going to win. So that's why they embarked on this painting so very early in the in the day and to their credit they actually painted in all the laborers as well including the Chinese labor corps and then of course towards the end of the year uh, towards the end of the war the Americans come in and so they thought oh my goodness by this time of course the, the painting had all been finished they thought well we'd better 
you know, paint the, the Americans in. And so they had to look for a space. They couldn't find any. And so they decided that the only thing that they could do was to wipe out some parts of the painting and paint over them. And so the Chinese Labour Corps were painted out of the painting and the Americans painted in. But I believe that there is one solitary Chinese figure still left in the painting. So there we have it, the Chinese Labour Corps. Uh, and uh, I should also point out that a, quite a number of Chinese labourers were asked to stay behind in France and Belgium after the war, right up until 1920, because as you can imagine, the fields were devastated. Uh, they were littered with bodies and with munitions spent as well as unspent. And someone had to clear them. The French farmers wanted to get back to agriculture. And so the British and the French asked the Chinese to stay behind to clear the land of these bodies and of munitions. And it was not until 1920 that finally the last batch of Chinese laborers went back. Now, of course, by this time, the Japanese had already gone into China. So we know from a number of diaries that by the time a lot of these peasant farmers went back, they had found their villages raised to the ground by the Japanese. Their homes, their families had been dispersed, their homes had been lost. And so after having toiled for three years or more at the Western Front, they had nothing to go back to. And there we have the very sad story of the Chinese Labour Corps. And back to you, David. Thanks very much indeed, Ben, and that was tremendous. Thoroughly enjoyed that. A uh, very enlightening um, talk, which uh, obviously shone a light into an area that uh, not many, uh, including myself, know anything about. So in the time-honoured uh, fashion, if everybody enjoyed that, if you'd like to uh, digitally raise your hands as a silent <laughs> round of applause, I can confirm <laughs> that, 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 that. Please imagine a round of applause with hundreds of people uh, clapping, which is digitally what's going on right now. Thank you very so, much indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. We, we've got half an hour for questions, which is good. So um, for the first question, ju just whilst people are typing the questions, we, we do actually have quite a few questions already. Mm. Um, the, the first question is actually via Facebook. Uh, Anthony McDonald's asked, um, w w were the Chinese labourers returned to China or allowed to stay in Europe? Um, ah, so, interesting. So, right. Yeah, so. Okay. Now, on that score, um, the French did allow a number of labourers to stay behind. And uh, this was partly because, as I mentioned, you know, they needed laborers to re restore the land and they thought, oh, well, you know, just let them be and let them stay behind. And quite a number of these laborers then got married to local girls. And that wasn't a bad thing either, because you can imagine that a lot of the men had, in fact, died during the war. And so there was no one to actually farm the land. And so the Chinese were then asked to stay behind. And uh, they were in fact, apparently, uh, the ones who established uh, Paris's Chinatown, interestingly enough. All right. Uh, but as far as Britain was concerned, no, everyone had to go back and they were all repatriated. Um, and that was mainly because of the uh, uh, British labor unions um, they, who would not, of course, understandably did not want um, foreigners coming into Britain to take away their very, you know, precious jobs. Super, th thanks for that. Right, okay, so Pat Adamson, find away the question, Pat. Right, I, I had two, I'll go for the first one. Okay. Did the Chinese take their own cooks? I know a lot of the Indians did and everything, and did that influence the fact that we like Chinese food today? <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> well, you know, Pat, uh, apparently when they first got to Europe, they had to eat the same things as the soldiers. 
Now you can imagine that the Chinese, you know, they don't eat bread. We don't eat bread, <laughs> and so they were very unused to that. Um, and and in fact, also another thing was that they weren't very happy with the portions either, um, because don't forget they were doing very heavy work, and so they would get really hungry, and so they would very often say, "No, we can't, we can't survive on this," and so you, we've got to be given our own food. And so in the end, uh, the British decided that they would just give the money to the to the Chinese, and then the Chinese could just go and buy whatever they needed, and they bought sacks of rice and then bought their own vegetables and so on. And that's what they cooked. And quite a few of them did actually know how to cook. And there's one particular person that um, I interviewed who said um, that his grandfather was in fact a cook at the front. I said, well, did he know how to cook before he left China? He said, no, 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 he, had, he knew nothing about cooking. And in fact, he used to boast when he came back to China, he used to boast to everyone, I learned how to cook when I was in Europe. <laughs> so that, that was what happened. But yeah, the, the food was definitely a problem. Um, and uh, well, uh, I just, just mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, the laborers who were able to stay on behind in, in France, they set up Paris Chinatown. And of course, a lot of those restaurants were run by them. So clearly the French must have, you know, started um, uh, getting to like Chinese food as a result of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for your question there, uh, Pat. Right, Ken Ellis uh, is next up. Um, Hello there. Hello, Ken. Uh, I'm gonna sneak in a question I didn't have time to type. I saw a photograph of uh, Baron Richthofen's funeral, you know, the air ace, German air ace, who fell behind, uh, crashed, shot down, I suppose, behind Australian lines. And, and it's a photograph of his funeral. I think I saw some, uh, some of the Chinese Labour Corps uh, mm. peeping over the, he over the hedge. And I wonder whether they were put out there after having dug the grave. It's Have you seen that photograph? No, I haven't, unfortunately, and I would be very interested in, in uh, looking at it. Uh, I can't comment, unfortunately, because I don't know. But certainly the Chinese were very much involved in digging graves for these for the dead. Um, and in fact, a lot of the graveyards that you can see lining the Somme were in fact prepared by them and they had to prepare their own Chinese, their own Chinese graveyard. Um, now, if any of you go back to the Somme, because I, I, I believe that quite a lot of um, uh, WFA members do frequent the Somme, there is one particular uh, Chinese cemetery totally dedicated to the Chinese. It's got about 800 uh, graves there uh, at Noyel sur mer which is you know, sort of just very, very close to the northwest coast and if any of you ever go there it's quite close to the mouth of the Somme uh, do visit it it's it's a beautiful cemetery I mean you know it's a, the reason I thought they were uh, the reason I thought they were Chinese laborers they're the only ones who didn't have headgear on mm. and I didn't mm. identify them by their features because it's so far away but right. I just, just by, by their by their uh, probably their body language and the fact that they weren't wearing anything on their heads and everybody yeah. else was. Does uh -huh. that make sense? Absolutely does. I mean, uh, very often they would not wear anything in uh, during the summer months, but um, if you uh, remember from the very last photograph of the, of the slide of the PowerPoint presentation, they had these sort of hats, berries kind of thing, you know, um, uh, during the winter months, but otherwise, they didn't have any headgear at all, no, because the kind of work that they were doing, I think any kind of headgear would have been in the way. To be also, honest. could it have been a status thing as well? You know, headgear is high or low status. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know whether there was not enough headgear to go around. I mean, obviously, the soldiers would have had priority anyway. But I think maybe for the, for the uh, Chinese, it was more a practical matter. Okay, Mr. Chairman, am I allowed to ask any of my other uh, <laughs> list, list of questions? No, you're not, Ken. Sorry. <laughs> okay, out, out of order. Yeah. Right. Okay. If, 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 if we're on to the question, which is highly unlikely, I will come back to you, but I, I'm going to move yeah, on okay. to, to, to the next person, I'm afraid, Ken. But uh, right. thanks for asking that question. Pleasure. Alan, Alan Atkinson. Uh, thank you, Ken. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Very, Hello uh, there. Very Hi, Alan. Very, very interesting talk there. 
Thank um, you. Back in 2018, I, along with I'm guessing a lot of people who are on this talk, on this site tonight, will have attended the uh, centenary conference at Wolverhampton University. Mm. Speaking there was a gentleman called Steve Lau. Yes. Who is the chair of the Chinese in Britain Forum. Mm. And he very much, his, his talk was actually entitled the, um, the ally that, China, the ally that lost. Mm. And I'm, I'm wondering, in amongst all the other travesties of China, the opium wars, colonization of Hong Kong, et, et cetera, to what extent does the, the outcome of the Great War, which um, essentially gave territorial concessions to Japan, rather than liberating uh, them to China, to what extent does that still resonate in, in modern China? Oh, hugely, Alan. I mean, you just cannot imagine. I started this whole thing by saying that every single child, Chinese child at school will learn or have drummed into them this century of humiliation, they're not allowed to forget what happened to China. And, and, you know, the birth of modern China goes back to all of those. In a sense, I suppose you could say it was a positive thing. I mean, it was a horrible thing to happen to any country, but it was positive insofar as it really galvanized the Chinese, I suppose. Number one, to get rid of the imperial dynasty once and for all, because clearly that was not doing anything for China whatsoever. And then to gather up strength and to you know, establish a republic, then gradually one by one to get rid of the Western powers. And what I'm about to say may be a little sensitive, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Nowadays, I'm, you know, China is very much presented in the news as arrogant, as a country that will not pay attention to what the West says. And all I can say is that my own feeling, my own analysis of that, having worked in China for a number of years, is that China has never really had any help from anyone outside China. It has always had to stand on its own two feet, despite having asked for help. And at those critical moments when it was not able to get any help, it has always had to resort to its own, its own strength. And it is precisely because of that, that it chooses nowadays not to listen to anybody. And I think within the context of modern history, you can understand why. I, I'm not saying that it's a good thing, but I think you can understand the reasoning behind that. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does, thanks. I'm wondering, did, did that sense of humiliation in, in any way color the way in which the, the veterans, the, the returning laborers were, were or were not treated when they got back to China? Oh, that's a difficult one, you know, because when they got back, um, those who did actually manage to save up money because their families had actually got hold of the money, uh, a lot of them were able, were, were held in great ex esteem by their fellow villagers because they were able to buy more land. And, and another person that we interviewed um, for our oral history film said, oh yes, my, my grandfather became a landlord, you know, <laughs> and, and he said that that was so unusual because he was a peasant farmer when he left China, but he came back and became a landlord. And so that was a big thing. Another descendant, I remember her saying that her grandfather came back, you know, uh, and managed to run a restaurant and, and open shops. So some of them did extremely well others not so well, particularly those who had gambled everything away or whose families did not manage to go and collect their wages. And also partly because of the fact that, as I mentioned just before, when they went back, their homes were no longer there. They had to start from zero, you know, and where do you go? If you've lost your family and you've lost your home, where do you go? You might have money, but the thing is, if you're uneducated, and you don't have any other skills apart from digging the land, what do you do? 
Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank uh, you, thank but, you. Uh, sorry, uh, going off the track a little bit, though, um, I should just mention that while probably, you know, a good 90% or more of them were illiterate, there was this very small minority of people who were educated who and who decided to go out as laborers, although they had never been, never done any manual, you know, hard work in their lives, because they wanted to see what it was like in the West. And there was one particular interview which I thought was really interesting um, with a person whose grandfather had come out to the West and he actually kept a diary and he said, you know, um, my just before leaving for, for Europe, my older brother had just come back from Japan where he had been educated. And he said, brother, you must go out because we can only learn to beat the West. We can only learn to beat the foreigners by learning from the foreigners. Yeah. And you'll only get to learn from the foreigners if you go out. Okay, and thank so you for that's that. why he went Thank out. you for that. So thank you very much, Wenlan and David and everybody else. Sorry for asking too many questions. No, no, no it's okay. Um, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Philippa Firth. Philippa, hello. Hello there. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I've enjoyed thank it hugely. Um, my, my question relates to um, my great-grandfather oversaw battlefield clearance at the end of the war and he had a wonderful team of um, Chinese labourers working with him and I have many descriptive letters of the musical concerts they provided and the cooking implements they improvised. And oh, also lovely. he mentioned It is totally lovely. And he mentions he's got this... Um, one, he's discovered he's got quite an artist amongst them and he uh, acquired paint and paper for him. And we have several of his paintings and they are wonderful. And each of his paintings is signed with his service number. So I know this gentleman's service number and I would like to know more about him. I believe mm. he's survived, not in any uh, uh, war grave anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so are there records for service? Numbers. Numbers. So, the mm. service number. That's what I would like to know, please. Yes, yes. Uh, at the National Archives at Kew, there is um, um, uh, a document which has all their service numbers and their names. And with a bit of luck, it might actually even tell you which part of China that person came from. So, you know, do try to look it up. And uh, if you get in touch with David and let me know how to how I can contact you, I'll try my best to help you in any way I can. But Thank that would be fascinating, really, to to have a look at some of those paintings. Really, it would be very nice. Will, uh, you, you never know. The, the 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 name of the the uh, the labourer is presumably actually on the paintings, and you know his name I Do you from the letters. I've I've asked a, a Chinese friend and he's looked and he said no the the um, uh, kanji are describing the scene you know with the sort of three three boys with the peaches peaches you know they're, they're traditional Chinese things and then his service number in Chinese and in um, English mm. numbers mm -hmm. so I don't have a name oh but, right so okay we'll we'll try to find out for you okay very much Thanks no, for thank that. you thank you. Sarah Helen Snow. Hi, I wonder if you can tell me when these labourers came over. They obviously were from rural areas. Um, how did they cope with uh, language barriers? Be it with the French <laughs> army or the British army or whomever they were working yeah. for. Did they have any education in their own schools at home, mm -hmm. or were they just shouted at loudly as certainly the Brits tend to do when? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and approaching people who don't speak their language. Yeah, excellent question, Sarah Helen, um, and uh, something that I should really have mentioned. Um, remember, I, I said that uh, a lot of the laborers were recruited via missionaries who were working in China at the time. And in fact, a, a lot of those missionaries, um, British, American, Irish, um, Canadian were asked to go to the front to work as interpreters. So very often 
these the the commanding officers of these um, companies of Chinese laborers were in fact bilingual and they had missionary backgrounds. Um, the other type of people uh, were doctors, medical personnel who were also working in China and invariably they had something to do with the church as well. So that was one source of interpreters. Yet another source of interpreters were students who, Chinese students who were studying in France at the time. Um, and they were there because of a particular education program that had been established by a very famous um, Chinese educationist called Li Shizeng, who saw that, you know, China was just being invaded left, right and center by all of these imperial powers. And so he thought the only way that we can do anything to, to improve ourselves and to educate ourselves and to make ourselves strong is to send people out to study in the West. And so a whole batch of people were sent over to France, France in particular, because of, you know, liberty, fraternity, all of that. And, and uh, so, and so, colonization. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the French were, were greatly admired and, and that's why they were sent out there. And because of course, you know, uh, the, uh, above a very long stretch of the front line was in Northern France. These men came from places like Lyon where they were studying and Paris. Um, so they, they served as interpreters as well. Going back to the missionaries as well, both the missionaries as well as these um, students, Chinese students, would hold literacy classes for the Chinese so that they could learn basic reading and writing. And I'm talking about basic Chinese reading and writing. And um, so in that way, they were able to write very simple letters back home. Ooh. But yeah, that, that is very interesting. Oh, uh, another thing I, I should definitely mention, you, you said just before, did the British just shout at them? Well, yes, there, there was a, a very, <laughs> there's a very famous example actually, which, which is mentioned quite a few times. Um, uh, according to one Chinese laborer who wrote a diary, he said, um, you know, it, when we were at the front, the British, because nobody could understand English, they would just give one word orders. So it would be go, you know, go do this, go do that. Now the, the sound go in English sounds very similar to the Chinese word go, which means dog. So a lot of the laborers thought that they were being called dogs by the British and they reacted very badly to that. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you can well imagine, but that, that's quite a famous uh, little anecdote. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your question there, sir. Uh, John Brumage. Oh dear, we, we, we have a technical problem. Um, let me just... Um, Maybe we can come back to John we'll later. We'll try to come back to you, John, but I think we've got bandwidth problems here. I've got okay. you. John's, John's question was simply this. Um, why were the Chinese called coolies? Hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, now, in Chinese, we have a word uh, which sounds like coolie. Cool means difficult, bitter. Li means strength. So a ku li is a person who literally just has to depend on muscle power to do a lot of really heavy work. Um, but a British academic said, no, 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 it's not a Chinese word. It comes from, what did he say? An Indian word, I believe. And because the British were in India well before they went to China, and they had this, you know, obviously a lot of interaction with them. This particular academic thinks that it was a word that came from India. So we don't really know. Okay. But certainly the word kuli in, in Chinese does exist. Thanks very much. I hope I got the question right there, John. Um, Andrew Boyd, do you want to just unmute yourself? All right, thank you. Uh, when we, uh, Fabulous. Thank you for taking time today. Thank you. Uh, my question comes from several visits to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. 
Um, Leavenworth was a major uh, training facility for the U.S. Army prior to World War, commitment to, the, to Europe in World War I. And the rapid expansion of the camp required laborers from all over the place. And there are lots of apocryphal stories about Chinese laborers suddenly appearing and building portions of the camp. Now, I have a belief that they may have been domestic uh, people living here who had, might have worked for the railways, et cetera, et cetera. But the word that keeps coming up is Chinese labor corps, or the name, not word. And I wondered if you'd come across any references at all to recruitment for uh, any of the American forces or any of the environments in North America. Um, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't personally. I wouldn't be surprised though, simply because um, certainly, you know, the Chinese were in America from an early point, I think. Um, well, we, we know that they certainly built the railroads, a lot of the railroads over there. Uh, but whether or not they were responsible, you know, whether the people who were brought on board to work for this, for this group of people that you mentioned were actually from those recruits that we've just talked about, or whether they were people who were there previous to that, I wouldn't be surprised if they were actually recruited from, from Chinese people who had been there previously. I wouldn't be surprised because I do remember now, the more I think about it, the more I seem to remember that during World War I, I think certainly in Canada, if not in America, uh, a number of local, so-called local Chinese who had uh, migrated to Canada very early on actually joined the army, their army. Um, so, you know, definitely there were Chinese about. But interesting enough, there are, as far as I can see, there are no monuments, there are no references. And again, um, when the, the centenary of the the last pandemic, the, the Spanish flu came around. Um, the Spanish, I'm sorry, excuse me, Chinese laborers were identified as a possible source. And again, I've, I've seen nothing at all in uh, the records here or looking at them. So I have no idea where that story begins, if it's, it could have a kernel of truth to it. Mm. Uh, I don't think anyone has actually got to the bottom of this, but I do know that there's been some discussion about the origins of the Spanish flu. And I remember, was it in 2017, I can't remember, 2017, 2018 maybe, that um, uh, the Imperial War Museum held uh, a conference at which a speaker did talk about the Spanish flu. And he said that, uh, yes, the, some people had argued that it had been brought over by the Chinese, but then there was another uh, argument that, um, that went, that, uh, according to which it had been brought over by the Americans, um, strangely. Uh, precisely. Precisely, in fact. And so no one's really managed to get to the bottom of this. And of course, I suppose <laughs> it's going to be difficult because it was, you know, a hundred years ago. It is. But uh, again, it was just one of those curious things. It, it, it wasn't a one off. It just it wasn't a single reference. It happened uh, more than once. Mm. So thank you for. Uh, no, again, no, not at all. But but in fact, Andrew, you know, uh, I mentioned the Chinese cemetery at um, in Noyelle sur Mer by, uh, at the mouth of the Somme. Many of those did, in fact, die of the Spanish flu. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, succumbed completely to that. Thank you. Fair question, Andrew. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so it's now bang on half past nine, but I've just got one final question. Um, for, for for you there, Wenlan. Um, 
basically, um, this is from Edward Astill, who um, I don't think he's uh, still with us at the moment on, on, the, on the call. But Edward asked a very interesting question, which actually ties quite nicely to the last answer you gave, which was, um, for the Chinese that, that died there, how were the funerals conducted? Um, how were the funerals conducted? I've not seen anything. Uh, all I do know is that at the time, uh, I haven't, sorry, I, I mean, I haven't actually seen any records, any written records uh, about that. But I do remember that um, when the Chinese came over via ship to, I mentioned Devonport and Liverpool, and then overland to Folkestone, uh, there are about two dozen people buried in these three places in Folkestone, Liverpool and Devonport. Uh, and I remember reading in one of them, oh gosh, where was it? Was it Liverpool? I think it was Liverpool, where it said that at the time, um, a few, few of the labourers had died. And so it was decided that the Chinese, the, the remaining Chinese labourers would then carry out a, a ritual and uh, so they all sort of lined up and they, they typically for a Chinese funeral, one wears white flowers. Um, and so they would make these paper flowers um, in a white color and they would strew them and then they, they would chant the, these sort of funeral chants. Um, and then they would bow uh, three times, which is the traditional way of a Chinese way of showing respect to the dead. Um, and so they did that actually at the cemetery. So I suspect that they would have done the same in, in France and Belgium. I imagine that they'd have carried on that particular method. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you know, the very fact that they were buried abroad, thousands of miles away from their home, it, it was obligatory almost, you know, for, for the Chinese to do something Chinese for their fellow, fellow countrymen. Because the, 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 is it the case that the, the cemeteries are created in a particular way in accordance with the culture, which is on a sloping site with well, running water, uh, or, or is that an urban uh, myth? No, 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 it's, it's absolutely true. You know, they were apparently asked to find a spot that they wanted. And so they, uh, they, they found this particular part near Noyan. They said, yeah, this is the one that we want. And as it happens, it was right next to the Chinese hospital as well. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, when they actually had everyone buried, um, Lutyens was then asked to design something Chinese to erect uh, by the gate of the, you know, as a gate to the cemetery. And it wasn't actually Edward Lutyens himself, it was one of his sidekicks actually, who actually designed the thing, but he got the uh, fame for it, <laughs> typically. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, if ever you go to this, this cemetery, you can see this archway and it looks sort of quite Chinese. And that was a, a nice touch actually um, by the British. Um, but I also have to mention that, as you all well know, the, all these graveyards are looked after by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And at the time, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission had a lot of toing and froing in terms of communication with the War Office and the Treasury. And the, both the War Office and the Treasury said, no, all the Chinese must be put together in one communal grave. And the Commonwealth War Graves said, no, no, no. You know, everybody else has had single graves and the Chinese deserve single graves as well, uh, individual graves. And so it was thanks to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that uh, the Chinese got their individual graves. That's, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, yeah that, that's good to hear. Um, okay, look, it's now nearly 25 to 10. So uh, we, we've uh, ever so slightly Run, run over the the allotted time. But, Sorry about uh, that. No, no, not at all. Um, it, it's the a function of the questions being. Uh, I mean, there's still stacks of questions which uh, I uh, we're just not going to have time for. But on on behalf of everybody, well, as ever, once again, if everybody would like to raise their hands as the the, the final round of applause uh, for for Wenlan, and, and once again, uh, thank you very much. For me, that it's a, a massive round of applause that you are. 
Thank not you. actually hearing, but it's there <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, I, well, I, as I mentioned, David, at the beginning of all of this, you know, if, if ever I do get the chance to come up to, to you in West Yorkshire, I would be very happy to bring the oral history film that we made because, you know, that really gives you an insight to, into the people and, and what they were like. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously we don't know what's going to happen with next year. So sure if enough. any of you are interested, do please just look us up on the, on the internet. It's just the Meridian Society. And when you go into there, you'll find a, a sub, you know, um, title saying called Special Projects. And under that you have the Chinese Labour Corps and our film is there. So you know, do please so, go into that. Please do, yeah. And just to clarify for, for everybody who's watching this, whilst I, I'm personally in Yorkshire, it's uh, a, a national indeed an international um, um, webinar is this. So if oh, right, a particular okay. branch would like to to invite Wenlan to, to, uh, to talk at, at the branch, please do. Uh, Obviously, get get in touch, and you can do so via me if if required. But uh, but it's it's not just a, a Yorkshire <laughs> event. Right. It's, it's a it's a truly national and indeed international um, audience that we have. Uh, anyway, look, many thanks indeed, Wenlan. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this evening's presentation, which has uh, shone a light into a, a an unknown area or relatively unknown area, and, and you've done so very efficiently indeed and on behalf of everybody on board uh, thank you very much uh, for anybody who is uh, interested in hearing part two of the Talbot House story that is Thursday's um, event at 8 p.m uh, when once again we, we have Simon um, beaming in from from uh, Popperinge uh, to talk about um, Talbot uh, House part two so uh, that will be very interesting. So if you uh, haven't yet registered, please do so. But uh, from me, that's all for tonight. Wenlan, once again, many thanks. Thank you. And uh, everybody, please do stay safe. Thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, my, my good wishes to all of you, wherever you are, and do stay safe. Thanks Goodbye. very much. Thanks. Bye. Good night. <laughs>